Christ and Muhammad are the closest in history. The mission of these two respective prophets, Jesus Christ, he was born miraculously. He says he's come only for the Jew. When we look at Muhammad, Muhammad is the most historical of all religious personalities. The mission of Muhammad is to the universe. Difference in the mission. Amid the confusion, the chaos and the pain, a man emerged and Muhammad was his name. And walking with nothing. Alhamdulillah wahda Was salatu was salamu ala man la nabi ba'da Allahumma ya mufattih al-abwab Wa ya musabib al-asbab Wa ya dalil al-hairin Tawakkaltu alayka ya rabbul alameen Wa ufawid umri ila Allah Inna Allah basirun bilibad Sadaqallah Sadaqallah Mr. Chairman And my dear brothers and sisters Topic is Jesus and Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them both, upon all his messengers, a comparative study of these two mighty messengers of God. See, in our own language, if we use these names, Jesus, we would have said, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. We would never say Isa. As Muslims, if our learned men in our masjids, in our private halls, Muslim halls, if they came to talk to us, lecture to us, and say, Isa, for Jesus, we would kick him out. But, you see, you say, the Western nations, they call Jesus, Jesus. Because they think he's God. Therefore, there's no mister, there's no reverend, you don't call him bishop, you don't call him pope. You don't call him prophet, you don't call him messenger, they just say Jesus. So I can't help it. Because of that, I said Jesus and Muhammad, may peace and blessing of God be upon them both. Where do we begin? The name itself, Jesus. See, I can't keep on saying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now people don't know what is this guy trying to hypnotize us or mesmerize us. So you will have to bear with me, my dear Muslim brothers. You'll have to bear with me. This is how the Westerner understands. Jesus. See, at the debate that took place between myself and an American, Palestinian Christian from America, Dr. Shorosh, one of the objections he had against the Quran was that in the Quran, the name for Jesus is Isa. We say Isa alayhi salam. Is Isa. And he said that, is, that was not his name in his native language, in the native language of Jesus, his name was Esau. That's a common name among the Jews, Esau. The classical for Esau is Yeshua. So he says, now look in the Quran, he's called Isa. That's his objection. He should have been Esau in the Quran, not Isa. As an Arab, he ought to have known that Arabic and Hebrew are sister languages. They are almost identical. And the name Esau and Isa are similar. The languages are identical. We say Ahad in Arabic, they say Ahad in Hebrew. We say Salam in Arabic, they say Shalom in Hebrew. We say Yomul Juma means the day of Friday, day of gathering, they say Yomul Sabah, Sabah. Yom, Yom. They're similar, almost identical. Esau, Isa is a variation in the Arabic tongue for Hazrat Isa Islam or Esau. But now we have a chance of asking them, the Christians, where did you get Jesus from? Look, Esau and Jesus, they are poles apart. Esau and Isa sounds almost identical. Esau, Isa. But where do you get Jesus from? Amazing. You see, they can't see it. Jesus Christ, he said, he said, judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, ye shall be measured unto you. So you hypocrite, why seest thou the mote in thy brother's eye, and seest not the beam in thy own eye? Jesus says, you hypocrite, take the beam out of your own eye first, 
before you try to take the mote out, out of your brother's eye. The splinter. You're going to beam in your eye and you can't see that and you're seeing the little splinter in your brother's eye. Jesus. Where does the word Jesus come from? See, this is the Latinized form of the Hebrew word Esau. Latinized form. Subject people, all subject people, they suffer from an inferiority complex. They would like to make their name sound like those of the, his, the ruling race. We might also suffer from such sicknesses. My son's name is Yusuf. So people will call him Joseph or call him Joe. Is it not so? The name may be Ibrahim. It's Abraham. You like to make it sound like that of the Englishman, your rulers. Now, the early Christians had the same sickness. They wanted their names to sound like that of the Romans, not like those of the Jews. Esau sounds Jewish. They didn't want their God's name to sound like a Jew. So they Latinized it by adding J. Where there was no J, they added J, Jesus. And they have a sickness for adding J's where there are no J's. Yusuf, they say Joseph, added J. Yaqub, they say Jaqub. Ayyub, they say Job. And everywhere where there's no J, they add J's, 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 to make it sound like that of the ruling master, the Greeks and the Romans. Inferiority complex. So Jesus is not his name. His mother, when he was born, never called him Jesus. She must have called him Esau or Yeshua, not Jesus. But besides the point, his birth. According to the teachings of Islam, our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made us to accept that Jesus Christ, Christ again, is another word which they have translated from Messiah, Messiah to Christ. Sounds like Greek, Roman. Saul, Saul, one of the self-appointed disciples of Jesus, they call him Paul, Paul. See, Saul sounds Jew, Jew. So they make it Paul, Paul. Peter, Peter. Peter was not the name of Peter. Nobody ever called him Peter in his life. You know St. Peter's in Rome? Peter. St. Paul. Paul was not Paul, it was St. Saul. St. Peter was St. Simon. His title was Kephas. Jesus said, you are Kephas. Kephas means you are a rock. You are a hard, hard fighting fellow, you know, hard-hearted fellow. You are Kephas. Kephas in Hebrew means a rock or stone. So they translated that into Greek, Petros. And from Petros, they got the word Peter. See, sounds Greek or Roman, Peter. But you say, Simon Kephas sounds Jew. They didn't want the heroes to sound Jews. So they changed the names. We in Islam are made to believe, through the lips of the holy prophet Muhammad وسلم, that Hazrat Isa السلام, Jesus Christ, was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth, that without any male intervention he was born. We believe in his many miracles, including those of giving life to the dead by God's permission and of healing those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. We believe. But we are in conflict with regards to his birthday. I was questioned whether we commemorate Christmas. I said, look, we enjoy Christmas holidays. <laughs> Christmas holidays we enjoy, but we don't commemorate Christmas. But when was he born? They tell us 25th of December. Christmas Day, 25th of December. But he was not born on the 25th of December. Today the Christians have come to realize, the learned men of Christendom, that he was not born on the 25th of December. This 25th of December is the, day, is the date of the birth of the pagan sun gods. Not the son of God. Son of God in inverted commas, not the Son of God, but the Sun God. <laughs> you know what it means? You see, you people here, this is the Northern Hemisphere. I come from the South. This is the Northern Hemisphere. And as winter approaches, December, it gets colder and colder here for you people. And as December 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, the primitive man, he could sense day by day, they can see the sun in the distance. 
far away. It's going east to west, further and further away, and it's getting colder and colder. So they personify that, that the devil is eating up the sun. Though they start beating drums and start offering prayers, that the sun may not be swallowed up, because if it gets swallowed up, they'll be finished for good. 24th of December, the equinox, and now you see the 25th, those primitive people in the northern hemisphere, they could sense the variation in temperature day by day. 25th, they can see the sun coming back into its own. In other words, the sun has now come out supreme. It has not been, a, the, the devil didn't swallow up the sun. It's coming back. So that is the date of the birth of the sun god. Sun god, the sun has come back into its own. Those, they celebrated Christmas, birth of, not Jesus Christ, the birth of the sun god, Baal, Horus, Apollo, Astarte, all these were the sun gods worshipped in the Mediterranean region. And their birthday was the 25th of December. So when the, the people became Christianized under Constantine, they accepted that birthday of the sun as the birth of the son of God, in inverted commas. So it is not the birthday of Jesus. The Quran tells us very, very clearly that when Jesus was born, his mother Mary was told, he says, shake the palm leaf, the leaf of the palm leaf, date palm, and it will let fall fresh ripe dates. Means the dates were ripe, ready. You just shake it and the thing will fall. And you can eat and refresh yourself with the rivulet, the small river running by, refresh yourself. After the birth of the child, she stole that. So it was midsummer. If the Quran says that the dates were ripe, it means midsummer, not midwinter. Palestine is in the northern hemisphere. Your winter and their winter is the same. So you don't have winter in midsummer. Dates in midsummer. So it was midsummer. Then the Bible also says that when Jesus was born, the shepherds were out in the field. Now the shepherd is a fool. If he with his sheep stays out in the open in Palestine, in midwinter, he will freeze to death and his, his, his sheep will freeze to death. <laughs> also says that when Jesus was born, the shepherds were out in the field. Now the shepherd is a fool. If he with his sheep stays out in the open in Palestine, in midwinter, he will freeze to death and his, his, his sheep will freeze to death. So if you reason the Quran and the Bible, they both confirm that Jesus was not born on the 25th of December in midwinter. But now because of that, men of learning in the West, they are now supposing that this Jesus was a myth, is a fairy tale, because it's connected with all these fairy tales. Jesus was no myth. He was a real historical person. According to the teachings of Islam, we have no doubt about it. That some 2,000 years ago, there was a young lady called Maryam, Mary, and she gave birth to a child called Isa, or Esau, or Yeshua, translated Jesus, and he was born miraculously. But the myth idea is because of this association with the pagan cults, the sun-worshipping cults. Now, when we look at Muhammad, a comparison, Muhammad was born some 600 years after Jesus in Mecca. Before his birth, his father died. He was the posthumous child, in a child that is born after the death of his father. And Muhammad وسلم, happens to be the most historical of all religious personality, according to Encyclopedia Britannica. No doubt whatsoever about him, that Muhammad could be a fairy tale, most historical, solid down to earth figure. History starts with him. The change of the Arab nation starts with him. The whole Arab world becomes known to the world for the first time in the history since the creation of the world. Since the creation of the world, the Arabs were an unknown people. Nobody was interested in that human rubbish. Nobody. Alexander the Great passed them by. The Phoenicians, the, the, the Persians passed them by. The Egyptians passed them by. Nobody was interested in that human rubbish. Nobody. 
It was after Muhammad that all of a sudden they become known and they become masters of the known world through the blessings of Islam. Before that, unknown. Muhammad is the most historical of all religious personalities. The mission of these two respective messengers of God, Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, opened his mouth at the age of 30. And by the time it was 33, three years time, they say that the Jews hanged him on the cross, did away with him as a false prophet, as an imposter, as a liar, as a cheat. They hung him on the cross, three years. The prophet of Islam opens his mouth at the behest of God at the age of 40, and for the next 23 years of his life, he reformed his people, 23 years. His mission is 23 years, Jesus was three years. And the records left behind, through the lips of the holy prophet Muhammad وسلم, Allah Ta'ala gave this book. Muhammad left this record behind, the holy Quran. A complete record. Everything that the Muslim ought to know, his duties and obligations, are all given in this book. You don't have to fumble for knowledge, for direction. It's all given to us. In the case of Jesus, Jesus himself, he did not write a word in his lifetime, not one word. In his lifetime, nor did he dictate to anyone to write a word. And nor was a word written, not a, not one. What we have today is a record, long after him, written down by persons called Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, Paul, and on and on. And that record is a record about Jesus. It's not his record, it's not what he said. This book, this is the Holy Bible, in this Holy Bible, is called the Old, there is an Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament is supposed to be, according to the Christian missionaries, that is the Injil. You know, we Muslims, we say we believe in the Injil. Of course, we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in all the Holy Scriptures originally revealed by God Almighty. Among them we name Injil. So they say this New Testament is the Injil. But let us see what they, the Christians themselves, they say. Here is a Bible, very beautiful Bible, very expensive Bible, this particular one here. This was presented to me by Dr. Shorosh. If you see the tape of the debate with him in the Royal Albert Hall, you'll find him, you know, with, he starts with his Arabic introduction, beautiful introduction, Arabic is his mother tongue. And he says, you see, we Arabs, when we go to meet a friend, we don't go empty-handed. We must present them with something. And this was in a green parcel. He handed it to me. I didn't know what it was, but I took it. But I found this very, very helpful, very valuable, invaluable. See, this Bible here is unique from many points of view. In this, that this particular Bible is called a red-letter Bible. I don't know whether you heard. How many of you heard about a red letter Bible? Yes. What? Hardly anybody. Two. Red letter Bible. You know what is a red letter Bible? I have to explain to you. Red letter Bible. You see, everything that Jesus spoke is in red. So it makes it very easy for you to know which are the words of Jesus. Because in the New Testament, there are 27 books. 27 books put together make the New Testament, the so-called Injil, the so-called Injil of the Christians. But these 27 books, how are you going to find out, sift out what Jesus said and what he didn't say? What Jesus said, you got time for that? Who's got time for that in modern times? So they have, the Christians have made things easy for us. They now, they put everything, every word of Jesus is in red, the rest is in black. So it's two color job, black and red, black and red. It also makes it easy for us now to find out to what extent is the New Testament the words of Jesus. So it's only about 10%. 90% has not got nothing to do with Jesus. 90%. Not even out of the 27 books in this particular one, this particular Bible is the King James Version, and they tell you in the preface, this is the fifth major revision. You know what's a major? You know, minor, small, major, big. The little children, they can't testify in court because they are minors. 
major grown up major big so this is the fifth major revision of the King James Version. King James, one of your kings here, in 1611, he had this Bible produced. It carries his name still today. But this particular one, by now, five times they made changes, big changes, not tiny things, major. That's what they, they say, and the Englishman knows what he's talking about. When he says major, he means major. After five major revisions, they still call it King James Version. You know, amazing. Look, I'm telling people, if your great, great, great grandfather, he made his last will and testament. And your great, great grandfather, he made a major change in that will. Then your great grandfather made another major change. And your grandfather made another major change. And your father made another major change. And you made another major change. And you still call it your great, great, great grandfather's will? Huh? <laughs> you know, poor King James, if he knows what's going on in his name, he will be twisting in his grave. <laughs> yes? What are you doing? And this is supposed to be the word of God. Five major changes. And when I start giving you the changes that they have made, it's chalk and cheese. You know, pulls apart. Things are taken out and thrown away without explaining why. If you like it, they keep it. If they want it, they change it. And what they don't like, they throw it out. Yes. And this is still poor King James Version. So this is what Jesus left. What did he leave? Out of the 27 books, 21 out of 27 in this particular Bible, 21 out of 27, you work it out at home what percentage that is, 21 out of 27 hasn't got a red dot or a dash or a doodle. Nothing. That means not even Jesus is quoted. They haven't even quoted him in 21 books out of 27. Not even one word, not even by mistake a red dash or red ink has gone onto, onto the page. And in the Living Bible, which the missionaries use, Living Bible, they call it. Also, another red letter Bible. You can buy that. Living Bible, they call it. The Living. Full of life. In that one, 23 out of 27, no red dot or dash or doodle. That means Jesus never even uttered any of the words. Everything is a black, black, black. This is what Jesus is supposed to have left, which he did. These are things written about him. He didn't write a word, and not a word was written in his lifetime. The mission of these two respective prophets, Jesus and Muhammad, their mission. Jesus Christ, he says, he's come only for the Jew. That's what he says. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 15, verse 24, you read there, that a Greek woman comes to him with a problem. Her daughter is seriously ill. And she comes to know that this mighty messenger of God has got some mysterious powers, miraculous powers. So she comes to Jesus, wanting her daughter to be healed. So Jesus turns his face away. She's persisting. So the disciples say, Look, this woman is persistent, drowning woman, clutching at straws. Drowning man does the same. Drowning woman, her daughter is... Life is at stake, you know, you said to master, please, help my child. So he tells her, and through her, he's telling the whole world. He says, I am not sent, but unto the lordship of the house of Israel. The mission of these two respective prophets, Jesus and Muhammad, their mission. Jesus Christ, he says, he's come only for the Jew. That's what he says. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 15, verse 24, you read there, that a Greek woman comes to him with a problem. Her daughter is seriously ill. And she comes to know that this mighty messenger of God has got some mysterious power, miraculous powers. So she comes to Jesus, wanting her daughter to be healed. So Jesus turns his face away. She's persisting. So the disciples say, look, this woman is persistent, drowning woman, 
clutching at straws. Drowning man does the same. Drowning woman, her daughter's life is at stake. You know, you said, Master, please help my child. So he tells her, and through her, he's telling the whole world. He says, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, of the Bani Israel, the lost sheep of the Jews. Only I'm sent for them. And when the disciples persist, he says, do not throw the bread of the children to the dogs. Who are the dogs? Another place Jesus says, do not throw that which is holy unto dogs. Do not throw pearls before swine. No Jews would throw pearls before these pigs. pigs. They're talking about human beings. To him and his people, the Jews, the rest of the world, they are the Jews, the chosen people, the children of Abraham, and the rest of the world is goyim, Gentile, unclean, uncircumcised. So he says, do not throw the bread of the children to the dogs. <laughs> Who are dogs? All those are non-Jews. You, me, the British, the whole bang lot. We are all dogs and pigs, according to the scripture. All, everyone is dog and pig. Not, I have not come for that. There but this poor woman. Her child's life is at stake. What does she do? She says, Master, even the dogs have crumbs, crumbs, you know, from the master's table, crumbs. So Jesus says, give her the crumbs. Crumb is the healing. Give it to her. And she was healed. The child was healed. Thank God. But that's the crumbs. The blessings, the teachings are not for the Gentiles, not for the non-Jews. They are all dogs and pigs, according. He's telling his disciples. He said, go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go ye rather unto the worship of the house of Israel. Throughout his life, he never preached to a single non-Jew. Among the 12 disciples of Jesus, not one was a non-Jew. The Jews, 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 100% Jews. He never preached to the Greeks. He never preached to the Romans. He never preached to the Palestinians. Preached only to the Jews. They are his children, according to the scripture. But of course, if people want to go and take it, because they say, well, look, we are hungry, we are dying, that's their business. But according to Jesus, he said, look, these are all dogs and pigs, and they don't deserve these blessings, the spiritual teaching which he has brought for his own children, the children of Israel, the Jews. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, according to the Holy Quran, we are told, he's made to say, wa ma arsalnaka. Illa rahmatan lil alameen. So we have not sent you, O Muhammad, but as a mercy to alameen. Alam is the world and alameen are the worlds. To the universe. I have sent you as a mercy to the universe. Allah, Allah, Allah. This I quoted you, this ayah, from Surah Anbiya. Surah Anbiya. What does it say? Where is it? Where do you find it? Very difficult. You don't do it because it's, you know, it's very difficult to the non-Arab, especially us. I don't know how the Arab does it. But to you at home, where are you going to find Surambia? How will you find Surambia? Look, the first young man who can tell me how you can find Surambia, he gets this Quran free. At the end of the talk, he'll get this as a gift. Come on, come on, young man. How do you find Surambia in the Quran? <laughs> Index, yes. You look at the index. This particular one here, you will get the Quran at the end of the talk. You see, at the end of this volume, this is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. At the end of it, there is an index, a very comprehensive index. What do you want to know? Anything you want to know. But Allah says you, open the index. And in the index, I said, now here I said, Ambiya. So on the A, just like in a dictionary, look for Ambiya, and it'll tell you Ambiya is chapter 21. 21 is easy to find because every page is numbered. Then I will tell you now, is ayah number 107, 107, easy to find. Once you find 21, 107 is easy to find. Everything on your fingertips. What do you want to know? Marriage and the M. You know about divorce and the D. You know about Jesus. What do you do? Open J in the index. J, and it'll tell you Jesus. Under Jesus, you'll find numerous headings. You know, Jesus Christ is mentioned in this book, in the Quran, no less than 25 times. Do you know that? No less than 25 times. But how are you going to find it? Index. His birth is described in two places. Where will you find it? Index. Chapter 3, verse 42, onwards. His birth. Chapter 19, verses 27, onwards. 
index. Find it, refer to it, read it, and share it. And this book here, this encyclopedia of 2,000 pages, is available to you all at five pounds each. I'm not here to do business, but I want to help you. Wallah, I want to help you. Five pounds for this encyclopedia of 2,000 pages. There's not another book that you can get in the world today, 2,000 pages for five pounds. This is yours. To give you the value of this, this book here in Birmingham, I purchased this from the bookstore called Hudson's. This is the Holy Bible. And I paid nine pounds, 95 pence. Five pence less and then 10 rams. For the two of this, I paid the price of one. This 9.15 plus VAT, that. <laughs> You owe it to yourself before you go, take it. It's good for yourself, for your employer, let's say your boss. There's no better present you can give Christmas present than this. Or your employee, somebody working for you, there's no better present than you can give this. His wedding present, give him this. His birthday present, give him this. There is no better present that you can give to your son-in-law, to your brother-in-law, to your employer, to your employee, anybody, everybody. This book must be shared to the rest of mankind. And it is five pounds each. So I said in Surah Anbiya, chapter 21, verse 107, we are told that the mission of Muhammad is to the universe. We have not sent you, Jesus said, I'm not sent. Muhammad is made to say, you are not sent, but to the whole of universe. Jesus said, I'm not sent, but to the Jews. Difference in the mission, the teachings. The teachings were suitable for the needs of the Jews, the teachings of Jesus. Look, he came for the Jews, he says so. He was particularly catering for their own sicknesses. The Jews had developed certain sicknesses. They had become hard hearted They had forgotten forgiveness. They had a law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Beautiful law for a nomadic people, moving from oasis to oasis in the Sinai, under Moses. They needed a law that will give them quick justice. There's no time for lengthy litigations. There's no time for putting a man in prison. So what do you do? Quick justice, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You damage my eye, go to the judge, he said, well, come, you also give it to him. He broke my tooth, he said, break his teeth. No, come on, man, there's work to be done. Move on, move on. Beautiful law. But laws have a tendency to change characters of people over a period of time. See, the racist people that, Hitler and Germany, Hitler right Germany. Germany, one of the most cultured nation in Europe, the land of Goethe and Beethoven. That, that nation could incinerate six million Jews. Impossible, man. How can they be so barbaric? Six million Jews, they incinerated, and because of, of Hitler, some 40 million people died. In the Second World War, 40 million people died. What a devil. How did he do it? A nation like that. No, you can be programmed, you can be brainwashed. See, in a community, they talk about Jew, 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 the parasite, the parasite, the parasite. So when it comes to some devil comes along and says, man, kill them all, put them in the incinerators, gas chambers. And the 90 million Germans, they just looked on. They looked on. It can happen, brainwashing. I come from a color conscious country, South Africa, mm -hmm. color conscious. I have invited hundreds of whites, businessmen and missionaries to my home for dinner and dialogue. I talk to them, I share with them my food and the ideas, and they enjoy both my talk and my food. You know, our food is captivating. You can enslave people through the tongue. Feed them, feed them, I tell you, you can enslave them. With your bhajjas and samosas and your... So they enjoy my food, they enjoy my talk. And when they part, profuse things. And subsequently, they meet me in the street. They want to know, how's the missus? Convey my regards to her. But no white man has ever called me to his house for a cup of tea, yet. <laughs> and I jokingly asked them, I said, you people, don't you know such a thing as reciprocation? In your community, don't you know what is reciprocating? They said, no, they know. And I said, how is it that nobody calls me for a cup of tea, man? I said, no, I tell you why. No, they are good people. Wallah, they are good people. They are good human beings, like any other community. But at the back of the mind, they are color conscious. Everything is color, color, color. We are divided by color. The Indian, the African, the colored, the white. Color, 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 apartheid, keeping people apart. So now, 
I give them a heavenly treatment. But at the back of the mind, see if I call this fellow, if he comes along with his wife and children, you know, with the, that long dress and that hijab, what you call that shalwar, and that dupatta, and you know, looking for the house, and people are watching, he says, where is this going? <laughs> and you knock at the door, and the woman of the house, she opens the door, oh, come in, Mr. Didad, come in. People are watching, so what's going on here? And five minutes goes by, half an hour goes by, he says, but this Mrs. Smith, you know, is she running a shibi, you know, or illegal liquor or something she's selling? <laughs> All this, the fear at the back of the mind, subconsciously is there. So the guy says, no, just say, can we my regards to the missus? Yes, thank you very much, sir. No, this is what laws do. Laws have a tendency to change characters of people over a period of time. Anybody, everybody. We all get brainwashed. We change characters of people over a period of time. Anybody, everybody. We all get brainwashed. So the Jews got brainwashed. Eye for an eye, put for a tooth. Eye for an eye, put for a tooth. They forgot forgiveness. So Jesus Christ, another spiritual physician among the Jews. He's a spiritual physician. He sees the sickness of his people. So he gives them a remedy. He says, it has been said by them of old time, the prophets of old. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not evil. He who strikes you on the right cheek, give him the other. This is an antidote, a remedy for a sickness. He says, if a man walks, makes you to walk, he says, agree with thine adversary quickly, while thou art with him on the way, before he takes you before the magistrate and makes you to part with your last father. He said, if a man takes away your coat, give him your cloak also. If a man makes you to walk one mile, walk with him two. I said, you good Christian Britishers, you should have welcomed Hitler. Look, that guy wanted this little island, that's all. Hmm? You should say, welcome. Look, that's what Jesus said. If a man wants to take you a coat, give him your cloak also. He said, look, my empire as well. India is for you. Australia is for you. South Africa is for you. What is this little Britain? It's what you ought to have done. But no, he said, you fought back. This is Islam. And Churchill said, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them on the seashore, and we'll fight them with broomsticks. He said, I admire you for that. This is Islam teaching you that. Jesus told you to turn the other cheek. Give your, if the man takes your coat, give him your cloak, your trousers also. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. But you didn't follow Jesus, you followed the Muslim, Islam. Islam says you must fight back, you must resist every oppressor. That is only suitable for the needs of the church. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gives us a perfect example for every situation. The Quran says, لَكَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا So most certainly in the Apostle of Allah, you have the best example in every aspect of human life. Where do you find this? In Surah Ahzab, it tells you chapter 33, ayah number 21, easy to find. Check it out. You owe it to yourself. Greatness. We are not trying to be little one or the other. But Jesus Christ, he gave us a standard. You see, he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, he speaks about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, we call him Yahya alayhi salam. You see, the Jews were expecting that before the coming of the Messiah, Masih translated Christ, Elias must come first. A prophet called Elias is supposed to have gone up into heaven, bodied before Jesus. And they believed that he was going to come back before the coming of the Messiah, the Christ. So when Jesus claimed that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah, they asked him, where is Elias? So Jesus points out to John the Baptist, that John the Baptist is Elias or in the spirit of Elias. And he testifies about John, Yahya alayhi salam. John was a common name, like Tom, Dick and Harry. You're not talking about that. I'm only talking about Yahya alayhi salam, John the Baptist. So Jesus speaks about him and he says, among those born of women, among those born of women, there has not risen another greater than John the Baptist. The greatest prophets among Israelis, among the Jews, was Yahya alayhi salam. That's what he said. But he says, he is greater than John. For the works, the works the Father has given me to accomplish. And Allah Ta'ala has given me greater responsibility. The responsibility of John was to prepare the way for Jesus. That makes him great. But now the responsibilities of Jesus are far greater. So the greater the responsibility, the greater the honor, the greater the status. So he says he is greater than John because of the work that the Father, whose God Almighty, has given me to accomplish. So the works tells you your status. What work are you doing? Sweeper? You have your position. 
But as a foreman, you have your position. You are a manager, you have your position. You are a director, you have your position. Everyone has his position according to his responsibility. So the greater the responsibility, the greater the honor. Natural. The responsibility of Jesus was to reform the Jews. That's all. Reform the Jews. Take them out of the formalism, the ceremonialism, the hypocrisies. That's his job. To bring the Jews to the right path. That's his job. That makes him so great about John. Now the responsibility Allah gives the Holy Prophet Muhammad is to guide the whole of mankind in every aspect of human life. And Jesus Christ prophesied about this mighty messenger of God. He told his people in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verses 12 to 14, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. You haven't got that capacity. I will tell you a lot of things. Like the little child here. These are little children. Suppose I met them alone. What, what can I tell them? I will tell them a few stories according to the capacity. I might have, I have a lot of things to tell people, to give, but I can't. I need the right type of people, mature people, who will understand what I'm talking about before I can open my mouth. So Jesus Christ is telling his disciples, you cannot bear them now. Nah, means you haven't got that capacity. And the truth of that statement is written large throughout the Bible. Throughout the Bible. Again and again, Jesus Christ tells his disciples, he said, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, how many times? Again and again. And he explains to them as if he's explained to little children, and they can't understand. So he said, I even yet without understanding, yet you can't understand what I'm telling you. I'm trying to explain to you like little children. And when he's provoked further by his disciples, he says, oh, faithless and perverse generation, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? I'm saying that if Jesus was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed that honorable harakiri, suicide. But what can he do? He said, I've got many things to tell you, but you can't bear it. Therefore, he said, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things so shall he hear? That shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify him. They're asking our Christian brethren, these missionaries, ask them, who is the spirit of truth? They say the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. I'm asking, what did the Holy Ghost tell you in 2,000 years? Problems, problems, problems. You have problems. You Christians, you have more problems than anybody else. <coughs> Solution to your problems. I was telling this lady here in the BBC radio. I was telling her and she was tickled. Her name is Julie Mills. See, chatting, chatting, I asked her, are you married? She said, no. I said, you see, you have a problem. <laughs> I said, you know, there are four million of your sisters and your aunties. If every beauty should get married, still there will be four million who can't get husbands. But the same man, I'm telling her, he can keep a dozen mistresses. And he can get a dozen illegitimate children every year. And your nation, see, he's a stud. He's a stud. He's a great guy. <laughs> he's great. The guy is great. A dozen bastard children every year. Great guys. I have to pay higher taxes for his pleasures, damn it all. I said, why should he make to pay for his wild oats? Why me? Why the innocent man has to pay higher taxes for his pleasures? Because those delinquencies be getting. Who's going to look after them? Somewhere around Liverpool, I was here on my previous visit, I'm reading the newspaper that the girls in Liverpool have gone berserk. They just want children. Anybody come, man, give us children. <laughs> I'm wondering, what, what has happened? He says, no, you see, in Liverpool, the municipality says that if you have a child, they are bound to give you accommodation. You can be unemployed. So says, if we have one little brat, at least, you know, we can say, look, I want accommodation. So they say, let anybody come along, give it to us. <laughs> I said, you have problems. Look, I said, something wrong with you Britishers. I'm telling this lady, I said, something wrong with you people. I says, you know, you allow gay sodomites. In London's Hyde Park the other day, there were 8,000 sodomites, you call them gays. They get in the Hyde Park, you know, to display the, the waves, telling you there's something wrong with you guys. 8,000. 
I said, you allow sodomites? License? Yes. Between grown-ups, you have license. Lesbians, license. But the most natural thing, a man is polygamous by nature, and he wants, and there's a woman who doesn't mind sharing a husband. There's a woman who doesn't mind. The man is prepared to take on extra responsibility. They say, no. Divorce one of them or go to jail. I said, something wrong with your thinking. She said, Shh, look, please, I want you to repeat that again. You see, she hadn't recorded that. <laughs> <laughs> so you listen Sunday morning, <laughs> you see. She made me to repeat that. I said, look, do it in three minutes, OK? I said, OK, I'll do it for you in three minutes. She was thrilled by God, because there are four million of her sisters can't get husbands. And Islam gives the answer, solution to the problems. What did the Holy Ghost tell you, I'm asking? There are a thousand different churches and denominations among the Christians. Thousand different churches and denominations. I want to know in the past 2,000 years, what did the Holy Ghost tell you about how to solve the problem? You have drunkards, alcoholism. What did the Holy Ghost tell you about that? About divorce in South Africa among the whites, the second highest divorce rate in the world among the Christians. I said, what did the Holy Ghost tell you about that? Problem of race, racism. Racism of the highest order. I want to know what the Holy Ghost told you about that. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Come to Muhammad, he gives you answer, solution to all your problems. It might not go down well. You're used to a certain way of life, but if you laugh, I said, the laugh is on you. You simmer in your soup. He will guide you into all truth. Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you. Many means more than one in your language. He will guide you into all truth. All is more than one in your language. Am I right? All means more than one. Many means more than one. I said, look, I don't want more than one. I want only one. Just give me one new thing that the Holy Ghost gave you thousand million Christians in the world today. One new thing that Jesus Christ already didn't give you in so many different words. Give me one. And in 40 years, no Christian born has been able to come forward and say, look, this is what the Holy Ghost taught us on how to solve the problem. <laughs> to allow sodomites, license, yes. Between grown-ups, you have license. Lesbians, license. But the most natural thing, a man is polygamous by nature, and he wants, and there's a woman who doesn't mind sharing a husband. There's a woman who doesn't mind. The man is prepared to take on extra responsibility. They say, no, divorce one of them or go to jail. I said, something wrong with your thinking. She said, Shh, look, please, I want you to repeat that again. You see, she hadn't recorded that. <laughs> <laughs> so you listen Sunday morning, <laughs> you see. She made me to repeat that. I said, look, do it in three minutes, OK? I said, OK, I'll do it for you in three minutes. She was thrilled by God, because there are four million of her sisters can't get husbands. And Islam gives the answer, solution to the problems. What did the Holy Ghost tell you, I'm asking? There are a thousand different churches and denominations among the Christians. Thousand different churches and denominations. I want to know in the past 2,000 years, what did the Holy Ghost tell you about how to solve the problem? You have drunkards, alcoholism. What did the Holy Ghost tell you about that? About divorce in South Africa among the whites, the second highest divorce rate in the world among the Christians. I said, what did the Holy Ghost tell you about that? Problem of race, racism. Racism of the highest order. I want to know what the Holy Ghost told you about that. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Come to Muhammad, he gives you answer, solution to all your problems. It might not go down well. You're used to a certain way of life, but if you laugh, I said, the laugh is on you. You simmer in your soup. He will guide you into all truth. Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you. Many means more than one in your language. He will guide you into all truth. All is more than one in your language. Am I right? All means more than one. Many means more than one. I said, look, I don't want more than one. I want only one. Just give me one new thing that the Holy Ghost gave you thousand million Christians in the world today. One new thing that Jesus Christ already didn't give you in so many different words. Give me one. And in 40 years, no Christian born has been able to come forward and say, look, this is what the Holy Ghost taught us on how to solve the problem. <laughs> the sublimity of the message to the people that he's, they are addressing, both Jesus and Muhammad. Jesus Christ tells his people, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Beautiful. Allah, beautiful. If you love me, keep my commandments. Means listen to me. Whatever I tell you, you do. You love me, then you listen to me. The Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is made to say, Qul, tell them, in kuntum tuhibboon Allah, say if you love Allah, then follow me, Allah will love you. If you love Allah, then you follow me. Jesus said, if you love me, 
you keep my commandments. You see, he's addressing a type of people who can only see the men in front of them. Like you tell your little children, there are so many ways you can encourage children to do good deeds. Number one is, look, if you don't do this, I give you a wrecking. Number two, I said, look, if you do this, I'll give you a lollipop. You know that little sweet with the, on the stick, you have the little lollipop. I'll give you that. I'll give you ice cream. You know, encouraging the child. You do this, I'll give you this reward. You know, I'll, give, I'll buy you ice cream. You do this, you know, I'll give you money. Depends now, you're bribing the child, encouraging the child to do good. Do this, you clean my car, I'll give you 20 pence. You're encouraging the child, you're bribing the child. That child, when he reaches the stage, you got to reach the stage where you do good for the sake of doing good. He's doing good now. He's behaving because he ought to behave. He's doing good. He's, he's very cooperative, very helpful because he ought to be like that, reaching different stages. There are stages and stages. You are at a stage when you can only see the man in front of you. You, want to, you, you like me? I said, yes. Well, then you must listen to me. You can understand that. But if you love Allah, God Almighty, the unseen God of the universe, you love Him, then you follow me, and Allah will love you. See the level, the level of the teaching. We are, no, he's only he's forced to address people according to the capacity, according to the understanding, according to the background. This is only natural. You can't speak over, over people's heads. You're talking something and they don't understand a thing. So he's talking to them in a manner which they can understand and follow. At the debate, the previous debate with Shorosh, he had glorify Jesus to the extent of divinity, that is God Almighty. And one of those qualities that made him to say that was that Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, he was so forgiving. He said, Father God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them. Beautiful. Beautiful. But I says, you know, there is a time and place for everything. Forgiveness has his right time and place. When you are down and somebody is sitting on your chest, like Hitler, had he conquered this land, and he said, the British he says, we forgive you. You know, Jesus told us, forgive somebody times seven. I said, you are a fool, man. Forgiveness calls for time and place. Now you go and take over, and now you tell them, so, look, you have done us so much wrong. But now, we are, look, learn mercy from us. We are not like you. We forgive you for what you have done to us. That's forgiveness. You are in a position to forgive. When you are helpless and you say, I forgive them because what else can you do? Real forgiveness? I said, there is a time when you've got your enemy under control. Then if you say, look, I forgive you. You know what you did to me? I won't do that to you. That is forgiveness. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, his forgiveness. Look at it. He conquers Makkah. He conquers Makkah. After 13 years of suffering, he had to flee for his life. His companions had to flee twice to Abyssinia, migrations, Hijra. Now, and they killed his daughter. What what they did to him and his people? Now, eventually, he conquers his enemies. What does he do? He calls them. He said, what do you expect at my hands today? What do you expect now? They knew his nature too well. They said, mercy, O generous brother and nephew. So the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, he says, I will speak to you as Joseph spoke unto his brother, Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam. You know what their brothers did to him. He said, I will speak to you as Joseph spoke unto his brother. He says, I will not, I will not scold you today. Go, ye are free. Time and place for forgiveness. Muhammad shows you when to forgive, that your enemy is under your control, you can do what you like with them, and then you say, look, I forgive you. Forgiveness. Fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus Christ and Muhammad are the closest in history to one another. And Jesus Christ is made to say, I refer to you about the Gospel of St. John. Now, in the Holy Quran, in Surah Saf, Saf, you find that under S, Saf, chapter 61, verse 6. Hazrat Isa, alayhi salam, Jesus Christ is made to say, Behold, Jesus, the son of Mary, said, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, Inni Rasulullah ilaykum. Most certainly, I am the messenger of God sent to you all, you Jews. Rasulullah ilaykum, musaddiqan lima bayna yadayya min at-tawrati. Confirming the revelation which came before me. 
in the Torah. Wa mubashiran bi rasulin ya'ti min ba'dismuhu Ahmad and giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me whose name shall be Muhammad, which is another name for Muhammad. He prophesied about the coming of our holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this prophecy is still there in the Christian Bible. It is still there, despite the fact that his words are not preserved as a whole, despite the fact only 10% of the New Testament are the words of Jesus, according to what they have, what they say, what they claim. 90% is nothing to do with, no, is not the words of Jesus. 90%. Still, this prophecy is still there. Where? I was showing it to an Egyptian lady. See, I was in Egypt. I had some visa problem. I won't go into details. A man from the Al-Azari failed. So he brings an Egyptian lady, well attired, westernized lady, well spoken, and he says, this lady will help you. So she tried and she failed. So she tells me, look, sit for half an hour, and I will try and see what I can do for you. She returns after over an hour and says, I want $40. I said, look, I'm a guest of the government. He said, look, $40. 20 for you, 20 for your son. I gave her the $40. She was so well-spoken, so I'm asking her, my smuki, what little I know, a few words about Arabic. I said, my smuki, what is your name? So she gave me a name. I can't remember, because it was so strange to me. Now, I never heard a name like that in my life. It went through one side, came out the other side. <laughs> my second question. I said, Anta Muslima, are you Muslim? She says, no, I'm a Christian. I says, right, right. To me, she's my customer. Look, this is what the Muslim ought to be doing, looking for customers. <laughs> Every Muslim, you know one fact? Look for a customer, for that one fact. Our Nabi Karim, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, he said, Balli aya. Deliver the message regarding me, even if it is one verse. If you know one fact, give it, man, give it. And Allah will give you more. This is the secret of knowledge. If you have one, you give. That one, you keep on giving, and Allah adds another, and another, and your knowledge expands. This is the secret of learning. Give, man, give. So I said, now here's an opportunity. I said, you know, knowing now she's a Christian and she's an Egyptian, so I said, you know Jesus, before he parted, he said, La kinni akulu lakum al-haqqu, innahu khairul lakum. In antalika, le allahu illa mantalik, la yati kum al muazzi, walakin in zahabtu ursilhu ilaykum. I didn't translate it for her, because she understood what I said. For your benefit, what I said was, I quoted her from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verse 7, where it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you, but if I go, I will send him. That's what I quoted her in Arabic. So I'm asking her, who is this Mu'azzi? La yati kumul Mu'azzi. So she says, I don't know. So I'm telling her, I said, you see, in the Quran we are told that Jesus said to his disciples, wa mubashiran bi rasulin ya'ti min ba'dismuhu Ahmad, and giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmad, which is another name for Muhammad. And Muhammad is Mu'azzi. She says, very funny. He says, you know these Egyptians, meaning the Muslim Egyptians, they take us to the cinema, they take us to the dance, but nobody tells us about Muazzi. She gave me a sledgehammer to beat the Muslims with. Look, she says, these Egyptians, means your Muslim brothers, they take us to the cinema, this Christian woman, you take them to the cinema, you take them to the dance, and you know from there where you go. But nobody tells us about Muazzi. So now as soon as I get into the city, I meet this elite, elite. Egyptian brothers of ours. And I'm telling them, I said, look, I met an Egyptian woman just now. And this is what she tells me, that you take them to the cinema, you take them to the dance, but you don't tell them anything about Muazzi. Is it true? And they say, yes. Our brother and say, yes. Everyone you ask, is it true? What she says? They said, yes. So what's wrong with you? 1,400 years you are there. The Muslim in Egypt is ruling, he's the master. Overall, 1,400 years. And in 1,400 years, you have not made even a scratch on the Christian community. I want to know why. Even now, are you prepared to talk to them? No. Utterly helpless. 40 million Muslims in Egypt, they're utterly helpless, speechless. They can't talk to the Christians. They can't. I want to know why. I'm asking them. I said, you? You Muslims? I said, you read the Quran? In your own mother tongue? He said, yes. I said, you understand what you read? He said, yes. I said, look, my people, the non-Arab, all my people. I said, you see, my people, they read the Quran, but they don't understand what they read. But you, you understand what you are reading. He said, yes. So I said, Allah is telling you 
He's telling us all, but because we don't understand, for us it's a water on duck's back. But as he's telling you, you Egyptians, Ya Ahlal Kitab, O people of the book, meaning O Jews and Christians, La Taghlu Fi Deenikum, say do not go to extremes in your religion. Wa La Taqulu Ala Allah Illa Al Haq, and don't say anything about Allah except the truth. Inna Mal Masih, most certainly the Messiah, translated Christ. Inna Mal Masih, O Isa Ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary, Rasulullah is the messenger of Allah. Wa Kalimatuhu, and a word proceeding from him, Al Qaha Ila Maryam wa Ruhum Minhum, which he bestowed upon Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. Fa Aminu Billahi wa Rasulihi. So believe in Allah and His Messenger, Jesus. Did you tell them that? He says no. The Egyptians are telling me no. I say Allah tells you. I say, tell them. Wala taqulu salasa. Don't say Trinity. In tahu khair lakum. This is stop it. It will be better for you. Inna Allahu ilahu wahid. For your Allah is one Allah. He is not three in one. He is not one in three. I said, did you tell them that? He says no. I said Allah tells you in the Quran. Lakat kafar al lazina qalu inna Allahu al Masih ibn Maryam. Anyone who says that Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, is God, is making kufr. It's an act of blasphemy. It's treason against God. Waqal al Masih, but Christ. That tells you in the Quran. Lakat kafar al lazina qalu inna Allahu al Masih ibn Maryam. Anyone who says that Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, is God, is making kufr. It's an act of blasphemy. It's treason against God. Waqal al Masih, but Christ. Waqal al Masih, but Christ said, Masih said, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, La Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord, in whom you shrik billah, whoever will associate anyone with Allah, Fakad Haram Allah Halil Jannah, Allah will make Jannah Haram for them, Wama Wahunar, and the fire of hell will be their dwelling place, Wama Liz Zalimina Min Ansar, and for the wrongdoers there will be no one to help. I said, Did you tell them that? He says, No. Allah tells you, قُلْ Tell them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, تَعَلَوْ Come! إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَائِمْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get out to a common platform. أَنْ لَا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That we worship none but Allah. وَلَا نُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا And that we associate no partners with Him. وَلَا يُتَّخِذَ بَعْضُ and that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. But if they turn back, tell them that we are Muslims. We are submitted our wills to the will of Allah. I said, did you tell them? Did you call them Ta'ala? I said, no. I want to know why. I said, you read this? You understand what you're reading? Allah is telling you and you don't hearken. Is this applicable to us? Deaf, dumb, and blind, you will not return to the body. Is it applied to, to us? What is it? Are you deaf? Are you dumb? Why is it that you can't open your mouth? They don't know. Wallah, they don't know. I'm asking the Egyptians, how is it that 1400 years you haven't opened your mouth and even now you're not prepared to do? I want to know why. I tell you why. The secret. The secret. You see, the secret is Allah gives you. Wallah, He's given everything to us. Nobody really reads the Quran. We have half of the Quran. Qaris, yes. We rattle off the whole Quran without the slightest mistake. But we don't understand one word, many of us. Not one word. Whole Quran we carry in our heads. But we don't understand one word. It's an amazing situation. It's a miracle. But it's a disgrace. Wallah. You know the whole Quran? We can rattle it off. The Arab can't understand. If you sit on the Kaaba and you're reading the Quran, you're reading the Quran, he's listening, mashallah. Hey, better than many Arabs. This is, he wants to talk to you. <laughs> you can't speak. <laughs> you mean to say you can read this book, whole book, and you can't, you can't even say, give me a glass of water. You know that? You can't even say, give me a glass of water. You know that if you're dying, you can't say, ma. <laughs> Amazing situation. What is the reason? Why can't you do the job? I tell you why. I said, you see, Allah gives you elementary, no, elementary secret. He says, Waqalu, and they say, the Jews and the Christians, they say, Lain yadkhul al jannata illa man kana hudan av nasara, that you Muslims will never, never enter Jannah. 
unless illa mankana hudan aw nasara unless you become a jew or unless you become a christian that's what the jews were telling the early muslims that you want to follow this ummi prophet this illiterate man he doesn't know how to read or write you follow him he's going to misguide you man you want to go to heaven you follow us the christians say you want to go to heaven you follow us so Allah says in answer to that, Tilka amani yuhum, this is their wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucinations. This is their hallucination. Qul, tell them, Hatu burhanakum, produce your proof, your certificate that entitles you to heaven and destines us to hell. Let's have a look at your certificate. That is the secret. Hatu burhanakum. Let's have a look. The very fact that Allah commands us to demand proof, it presupposes that when proof is produced, you will be able to analyze it. That's what it means. Once you start doing that, he hasn't got a leg to stand upon. Wallah. There he's got no chance against you. You have to now ask him for proof. But without you asking, he's provided you the proof in 2,000 different languages. You know that? The Bible. He says, yeah, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. He's giving you free Bibles. You know that? There is a work afoot at the moment now. Shuru said that 5,000 Bibles were shipped from America to be distributed at our meeting, free. But he says they addressed it wrongly. It went somewhere else. <laughs> this is our last work. <laughs> last work. <laughs> but still, they'll reach you. Sooner or later, they'll reach you. See, look, they're persistent. They have that persevering quality which we haven't got. They will persevere and they see that you get it. You were supposed to ask them for proof. Without you asking, they say, look, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. Now you're going to swallow that? No. What you do? When Allah commands us to demand proof, it presupposes that when proof is produced, we'll be able to analyze it. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Nonsense. Once you start analyzing it, you find he hasn't got a leg to stand upon. Things that he's telling you is not in his book. Whatever he's trying to teach you is not there. What you do? But get these little books. When you get the Bible, you need this book. As an instruction book, what to do with the Bible? Is the Bible God's word? Get it from the Islamic Propagation Center in Birmingham. Or start one here in Bradford. We will help you, inshallah. Start one here. That you can give literature. You master it, you study it, and you help your other brethren. And you share with other people. You don't sit on your backside doing nothing and waiting as a sitting duck, sitting target, using for people, the people to come and practice in you like a punching bag, boxing, practicing on you, using you as a doormat, eating our, drinking our tea, eating our samosas, and then making mess of us. Is that the role Allah has in store for us? No. He says, Allah says, the destiny of the Muslim and Islam is, is that you use the hero who Allah deen kulli. He's given you a deen, there is a master, overcome and supersede them all. So, who will the Rasulullah who will he it is who has sent his messenger with guidance, with the al-haq, and with the religion of truth. That it may prevail, overcome, and supersede every other deen, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, Judaism, every ism. Islam is destined to master them all. Say, waqafa billahi shahida. And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that he's going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you. But you rubbish, he's giving you and me that opportunity to serve his deen. To do a prophet's job and earn a prophet's reward. Will you take it? That's the question. Will you take that, that honor, that privilege? He wants you to do a prophet's job and earn a prophet's reward. Because if you do a prophet's job, Allah will be less to you. If you do the manager's job and he pay you a sweeper's reward. Allah is not like that. Do a prophet's job, you get a prophet's reward. And that's your destiny. Not with the gun, not with the grenade. If you had it, even if you had the laser gun, Allah forbids you using it. He says, there is no compulsion in religion. Like Rafidin. There is no compulsion in religion. Even if you had it, you can't use it. Because force means nothing. It's worthless. We have a few Christian brethren among us, a few non-Muslim among us, and listen, I will get you. Come on. Mm -hmm. Say the kalima, the shahada, the creed of Islam. So what's that? Say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Otherwise, we'll kill you. So the poor man says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. <laughs> I'm asking you, what is it worth? Worthless, rubbish! Allah says, no, you can't do that. It must be willful acceptance, cooperation, willingness, getting together, fellowship of faith, get together. And this is the destiny of the Muslim, to do the job 
And the way to do the job, you have to master his weapons, the weapon he's carrying, his book. You must know his book. Once you know his book, he is child's play in front of you. So with these words of my dear brethren, I want you to take this challenge up. Challenge. Islam is a challenge to them, and to us the whole world is a challenge. We are destined to change the world for Allah. Not for ourselves, for Allah. And the way to do it is, you master the weapons of the enemy. Our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa said, War is strategy, and strategy demands that you use the weapons of your enemy. And the weapon that he uses is the book, the Bible. You master the book and go to town. Wa akhru dawana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. May I sincerely thank you for a very enlightening and illuminating discourse. May Allah reward you for that. Alhamdulillah, there is a lady who is, I think, British and Christian. She wants to accept the, uh, she, she wants to embrace Islam and to come to Islam. So, you implied, at least, that Jesus only came to the Jews. And yet, he said to one of the leading Jews that God so loved the world, and that includes us all, that he gave his son, that if we believe on him, we should not perish. Also, when a Roman centurion came to him asking for healing for his servant, he said, I haven't found such faith in Israel, and that many would come from the east and the west and feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because a lot of the Jews would not be there. You see, sir, the first verse you quoted, the Greek was from John 3.16. Now, Jesus didn't utter those words. Those are the words of John. Jesus didn't say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, these are not the words of Jesus. You look up in this red letter Bible, you'll find these are not the words of Jesus. They are in black. <laughs> You're nodding your head. But this is what your Christian scholars tell us, that these are not his words. With regards to the centurion, look like the Roman soldier. Did he convert the man? Did he convert the Roman? Did he convert the Greek? Nobody. Out of the 12 disciples, not one was a known Jew. 100% Jews. However, any other question, please? Uh, when I came to the uh, meeting tonight, I wasn't quite sure what I was coming to. When I came through the door, I was left in no doubt at all. Um, I, it was entitled Jesus and Mohammed, and thank you for putting Jesus first. Um, I, I'm sure you'll accept that you did not put the case for Christianity as a Christian would put it. I'm sure you would, and that I can understand in an audience of this, this kind who was already persuaded towards the Muslim way of thinking. Um, and uh, indeed, I, I would say that I, as an individual, would respect the Quran. Uh, I'm afraid you did not respect my holy book, which is the Bible, in quite the same way. In fact, I'm a teacher, and in my classroom, I've got a television which is fixed to the wall. And on the top of the television, there's just room to put the Quran, because I respect, in my, my, I've got Muslim children in my school, and I put the highest, I know you respect your book, you want to put it in the highest place. So I do that, I put it in the highest place. Now, what I'm saying to you is this, you've not really ex, uh, given, uh, in my opinion anyway, the Christian loving and forgiving, these are the two essential things, although you denigrate forgiveness for some reason, uh, as highly as I would. But more than that, perhaps you answer this point. Um, Muhammad, you've talked a lot about Jesus, you've talked about, a lot about our holy book, we're not talking much about, uh, about uh, Muhammad, or, or indeed the Quran too much, um, apart from the missionary aspect of it. Um, could you tell me how you can believe, and indeed anybody in this room can believe, in one man who um, couldn't read, couldn't write, indeed uh, could get his followers uh, by bloodshed through war, uh, how you can believe that that man was a follower of God, let alone a prophet of God, uh, to, um, uh, and to accept all his teachings as you do so glibly, and yet reject Christianity and the holy book of Christianity so, so, so easily as well. You see, you have thrown in so many things in this little contribution of yours that how can we believe 
in a man who was illiterate and who by bloodshed, who had spread his faith, converted the people. Now with regards to the man being unlearned, this is a fulfillment of the prophecy in your book. A fulfillment. The book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 12. It says there, and the book is given to him that is not learned. The book, please, please. The book is given to him that is not learned, saying, read. And he says, I am not learned. Now, if you look for in the religious history of man, in the Bible, you will never find an occasion where any prophet of God, when given the message of God, he says, I'm not learned. But if you read any biography of Muhammad, any written by Muslims or non-Muslims, they will tell you that the first revelation that was given to him in Ghare Hira, the Mount of Hira, when the angel of God comes to him and commands him in his mother tongue, he says, Iqra, read. And Muhammad says, Ma ana bi qari'in. He said, I'm not learned. So the angel of God commands him a second time, Iqra, read. And again he says, Ma ana bi qari'in. He said, I'm not learned. For the third time, the angel of God embraces him hard and he says, Iqra, bismi rabbi kalladhi khalaq. Now he grasped the message that what he was required to do was to repeat. Because this Arabic word Iqra means to read, to recite, to rehearse, to repeat. And he repeats the words as they were given to him. Iqra, bismi rabbi kalladhi khalaq. Read in the name of the Lord and cherisher who created. Khalaq al insana min alaq. Say, he who created man from a mere plot of congealed blood. Iqra wa rabbu kal akram. Say, read in the Lord is most bountiful. So he says, Iqra wa rabbu kal akram. Say, Allah zi allama bil kalam. Say, he who taught the use of the pen. So he says, Allah zi allama bil kalam. Say, Allah al insana ma'alam ya'alam. Taught man that which he knew not. The very fact that the man is unlearned is a proof that this book is a book of God. You misunderstand the point I'm making. Let me finish. Let me finish. All right. That this book is the book of God. An illiterate man, a man who can't read or write. Uh, excuse me. Look, shh, don't disturb the gentleman. This man can't listen to two persons at the same time. Nobody can. So, the very fact the man can't read or write, and he produces a book of this nature, giving solution to all your problems. All your problems. This is a challenge. I said, look, come on, man, you have problems. You have four million women in England today who can't get husbands. Even if every Englishman got married, it will never happen. You got four million of your sisters and your aunties and your cousins, they can't get husbands. What is the answer? I said, this book gives you the answer. Problem of alcohol, you have no answers. Two thousand years you are fumbling. This book gives you the answer. I could answer that by saying, say, what me. about the you kidnapping are, in Lebanon, which was done by you, Muslims? You, what about the Iraqi-Iran war, which is done by Muslims? What about all the other things? No, listen, you misunderstand the point I'm making. You, you, I'm making the point that I'm not trying to denigrate Muhammad. I wouldn't do that in, in an audience like this. Brother, Muhammad, uh, why, I, I will listen to you, but why not let me finish it? Let me finish. Look, yeah, you are the principal. Yes, 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 yes. You are the principal of a school, and you know. So look, you asked a question. Let me finish. We'll give you a chance again. Please. The second charge, that he spread his religion by bloodshed. You see, you know your great man, your great man. Thomas Carlyle, you heard about him? One of the greatest thinkers of the past century. In 1840, in England, he delivered a series of talks on heroes and hero worship. And you know whom he chose as his hero prophet? Muhammad. You know that, sir? Muhammad. His hero prophet, not David, not Solomon, not Moses, not Jesus, but Muhammad as his hero prophet. Your man, Thomas Carlyle, and he defends Muhammad. Listen to him. Then I listen to him. After all, look, who was bribing him to say the things that he was saying? I want you to tell me. He said, look, some Arabs bribed him in 1840 here in England. When the Arab world, the Muslim world is down in the gutter, the whole lot of it. This Englishman, or Britisher, Thomas Carlyle, he says about this accusation of yours, sir, the chest sword. He said, the sword? He said, the sword indeed. But where will you get your sword? He said, every new opinion at its beginning is precisely in the minority of one. In one man's head alone, there it dwells as yet. It is one man against all men. That he take a sword and try to propagate with that will do little for him. He said, first, you must get your sword. Where do you get your sword? Where do you get your sword from? By force? One man against all men, the whole nation? What uh, Well, I'm a school teacher and I'm a fundamental Christian. Um, 
and I've been involved in many denominations. I only see Christianity in terms of Jesus, not in terms of the different factions of churches within Christianity. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I really am concerned with the um, examples of Christian behaviour which you cited to the audience tonight. Uh, those examples being the, the mothers in Liverpool, uh, those examples being the divorce rate in England, those examples being, you know, the kind of world that we live in, and I agree that England is a desperate place in need of redemption, but, I mean, I believe that's through Jesus. I'm not questioning Mohammed, but I'm saying that I believe in Jesus. But I'd just like to know, do you think that you have given fair examples of Christian people and their behaviour? Do you think people you quoted as examples are in fact practising Christians? What I was doing was that, look, you have a problem, which you accept, that you have a problem. The, the Christians in England, the Christians in England and in America, and all over the world, you have certain problems. In South Africa, they have certain problems. I think this is the problem. This is your problem. Your problem is that you are sort of looking at the culture, assuming because we have a nominal Christian head, that is the Queen, who is the head of the Church of England. I mean, I don't know whether the Queen is a committed Christian. I don't know whether Margaret Thatcher is a committed Christian. I'm, you know, I would be, I'm very concerned that they become committed Christians because they, only then are they able to lead the country. Uh, I think the problem is when you assume that the people you quote as examples, divorces and all this kind of thing, then you uh, are in, on very dangerous water because you're actually condemning people who are, neither, are not Christians at all. Do you understand what I mean? So <laughs> now you have an answer. You see, if you are a Christian, which you claim you are, the Queen of England is not, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher probably is not, you are, you see, you are born again. No, no, you are born again. So you believe that you are a Christian, but the rest of this country who fill the census forms, when they're asked what religion, they don't say Jew, they don't say Buddhist, they don't say Muslim, they put down Christian. Yes, this so, is so, Christian. Right, right. So, so what you do is they fill the census form as Christians. The Muslims, when they fill up the forms, they also fill as Muslims. That doesn't mean that they're good Muslims. But if a Muslim does something evil, I can't say he's not a Muslim. You see, it's very easy way out for the Christians. He's not a Christian. I say, well, look, your brother did such and he committed murder. He raped somebody. Sutcliffe was a Muslim, for example. I feel ashamed. I say, well, he was a very bad Muslim. I can't say he's not a Muslim. You can get out very, get off very easily. Say, so look, Margaret Thatcher is not a Christian. Bhutan in South Africa is not a Christian. Regan is not a Christian. Oh, the Swagat, you know, he was tantalizing millions on TV. Swagat, and when you heard him, you and every born again Christian in America, 75 million born again, when they were listening to him, they were adulating him as a Christian. Now when he's caught out, and then he said, no, he's not a Christian because he's caught out now. Swaggart got caught out, Jim Baker got caught out, Marvin Gorman, Reverend has got caught out. So immediately you turn back, he's not a Christian, he's not a Christian, he's not a Christian. Very easy way out. But now you are a Christian and there are many like you who say you are born again, your new life. I said, right, so now you have to supply the answer, the solution to the problem. You have four million of your sisters which if every Britisher gets married, they can't get husbands. Now, this, you're born again. Now, how do you satisfy the needs of those four million of your sisters and your aunties who can't get husbands? Now, you work that out, and you come back and we listen to you. But if you have to go to the back now. You go to the back. I'd just like to make a suggestion and ask for your comment on it because I think we could argue till we're blue in the face about the, the bad points of what people who are called Christians have done in the past and the bad things that people who call themselves Muslim have done. We could sort of go backwards and forwards like a tennis match with that sort of thing. Um, also, as, but, I mean, so that's, that's, to me, my suggestion is that you've got words in the Bible um, that you accept, like the prophecy that you attach to Muhammad um, which is weird attached to the Holy Spirit, so another tennis match. No, it's the Holy Spirit, no, it's Muhammad. Um, and then um, you say about the major revisions being changed, but the Bible, I'm, I just want to ask you 
response is this. I'm not, I'm not a speaker, so it takes me a bit to... <laughs> right, so um, the, the Bible translators uh, use Greek manuscripts that go back to the second century. So another argument that surely you can't say is about that the Bible is revised since the King James in 1611 five times, so it can't be true anymore, because the, the more that they revise it, this century they've found more manuscripts that go further back and they use these Greek manuscripts and compare it all like these boffins do. So the, the question is, um, how can you know um, what is the truth by, by this sort of arguing? Because the third caliph, apparently, from what I've read, also had influence on the compiling of the Quran. You know, sort of, he had a, a book, a Quran that had been um, his wife had had under the bed or something. Then there was other writings that were starting to get circulated, apparently. And the third caliph, got it together and said, right, we've got to make a final Quran and decide what's going to be the, the true word. So, uh, surely, the only way that we can really know which is the true book is not to say, to, from our own background, look, I'm a Christian, so I'm going to say this, and you say, well, I'm a Muslim, so I'm going to believe this. Surely, it's to get both books, sit down with both of them, and to say, God, the true God, please speak to me. Read both of them and just ask God to show you. Surely, that's the only way. I don't think we could argue to a blue in the face, but, you know, I can say that I love you because Jesus put love in me. So that's the answer for the world. Um, and you could say this and that and the other. But surely, what's your response to that? that? To sort of get both books and say, God, which is the truth, instead of sort of arguing that the Bible's been changed. You know, they've got second century manuscripts. You know, and the third caliph changed the Quran. You know. So what, what's your response to that? Is, is that surely the only answer is to just pray instead of using all these arguments? Surely it's to just... Pray. I mean, what do you think of what? You see, you have been telling us in so many words that let us take these two books and start reading them both and allow God to tell you from heaven, say, look, this is not the book of God, but this is. Not the Bible, but the Quran. And you will listen. You will listen to that God. If the God, you hear the voice from heaven telling you, he said, look, this Bible is not the book of God. This is according to Bernard Shaw, your great man, George Bernard Shaw. You know the playwright. He said, this is the most dangerous book on earth. He said, keep it under lock and key. Your children must not have access to it. That's what he said, George Bernard Shaw. The Plain Truth magazine, you know, a Christian magazine coming from America, seven to eight million a month free copies are being given out. They say that many a censor will give it an X rating. I don't want to go into all that. We went through all this on Sunday. But now, you know the guy who talks about God telling him, Marvin Gorman, you know the Marvin Gorman in America, tele-evangelist? That is what he claimed. God talks to him. Marvin Gorman, Reverend Marvin Gorman, he was caught for adultery and he was defrocked by his church. Jim Becker, God speaks to him. Jimmy Swaggart in his works, if you ever read them, he says, God speaks to him, he says, my son, my son, and he's telling him what to do and what not to do. But this God Almighty didn't tell him not to go to a prostitute twice a month. No? and what he was doing there. So, the people who are talking about God talking to them, there's some type of sickness. They need psychiatrist. The guy who says, now God, because God doesn't talk like that. He doesn't come to you every Tom, Dick, and Harry and tells him, say, not this book, but that book. If he was doing that, he would have done it to everybody. Everybody would have followed Christ or everybody would have followed Muhammad. God doesn't do that. He has given you intelligence. He has given you intelligence. And that intelligence you are to use. And what I was put. I found your lecture very informative and at times entertaining, very interesting to listen to. What I found very sad, I am a born again Christian. What I found very sad was that in 40 years, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you did say that in 40 years you've never met a Christian who has been able to come to the front and tell you what the Holy Spirit's done for him. Is that correct? Go ahead. I, I think I said that in 40 years that I'm doing this work, Nobody has brought forth one new thing that any church, including the born again, you have to come and tell me that this Holy Ghost came and told you solution to these problems. Where? Which church he came to? When did he come to you? To give you answers for the rest of Christendom that now alcohol, what you do about alcoholism, what you do about gambling, what you do about surplus women, what you do about racism. I want to know what the Holy Ghost told anybody. In 40 years I'm asking, 
nobody has come out with one new truth which the Holy Ghost gave to any church at any time. One new truth. If you have it, let's hear. Yes. Well, I should be a reasonable man and a deep thinking man. God is interested in men and women. And God is interested in my life. And since the Holy Spirit came into my life, when I became a born again Christian, he's helped me make decisions concerning my money. He's helped me make, he's helped me to love my wife. Individually, any system. See, there are people looking for a way out. Christians are looking for a way out. Some find it in Hinduism. Some join the Hare Krishna movement. Some join the devil worshiping cult. Look, you find somewhere along the line, the guy gets caught out, he becomes a Jehovah's Witness. He says he found it. He becomes a Seventh-day Adventist, he found it. Some become born again, he says he found it. The experience this is talking about is something subjective. In other words, human being, anybody, you're looking for a way out, his wife and him must have had quarrels, endless quarrels. Maybe he was imbibing too much alcohol. All these were problems there. He was looking for a way out and somebody came along with a little charisma and said, look, my son, allow Christ to come into your life. I say, it works. It does work. There's no doubt about that. But Hare Krishna movement also works. Islam also works. Buddhism also works. You are a drowning man clutching at straws, somewhere along the line, some little help, and you have saved yourself. But the question still remains. Look, you haven't answered the question. 40 years, not a single Christian in the world of any church or denomination has come forward to say that the Holy Ghost gave my church this solution. The Anglicans, the Roman Catholics, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans come. As any church that says we heard the Holy Ghost came and told us how to solve the problem of surplus women, how to solve the problem of alcohol, how to solve the problem of racism. Look, these are individual experiences which everybody is going through at all times. I'm not doubting you, my son. What you said, I believe that your life could be changed, but this does not change 60 million Britishers. It won't change 250 million Americans. You need a way of life, direct instructions, which each and everybody can understand in a clear-cut language. And this book gives it to you. Assalamu alaikum. Sir, I am a Muslim. My point to you, sir, is this that at the start of your uh, well-prepared and well-researched talk, you referred to Jesus Christ as Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. I, as a Muslim, like yourself, believe in Hazrat Isa alayhi salam as a true prophet of God. As your ten talk went on, I got the feeling, perhaps I was alone in getting that feeling, maybe other people who listened to your talk uh, in an open-minded fashion as I did, I tried to do, I got the feeling that at times, with due respect, you, you appeared to mock Hazrat Isa al Islam, Nauzubullah. You appeared to mock his teachings. And therefore, I feel that if that feeling is correct, that in the course of your talk, you have not only, again with due respect, not only contradicted yourself, but also misrepre misrepresented the teachings of Islam which are to respect all the true prophets of Allah. What are your comments on this, sir? Before you move away from the mic, you see, you made an allegation, very serious allegation, that I mocked Jesus. I just want you to give one example. One example, look, I spoke for more than an hour. Surely you can give one example. Let the people hear what mocking did I do as a Muslim. One, one example. Let them hear. My impression was that uh, Hazrat Isa al teachings were true teachings of Allah and Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam's teachings were uh, a development of those teachings, an expansion of those teachings, as you so correctly said, to the world at large. But in, your, the, in the way you delivered your speech, in the way you referred to Hazrat Isa al -Islam in the course of your speech, there was no particular example as such. But one and a quarter hour, you can't give one example of mockery, but you feel you say that these teachings were incorrect, and that please quote, please quote. Look, this is hypocrisy of the highest order. When you come forward say you are a Muslim, and you are talking with tongue in cheek, and you said there are people who follow you. I don't know what you mean. They said there are some there are people who follow you. 
whether you belong to some new kind of elite uh, mazhab or what, I don't know. You said people who follow you. I don't know who are the, your followers here. All these are your followers. Huh? No, no, then... Well, you said they follow you. Now, look. You see, this is... You are making mischief, my son. You, you are making mischief. What you have to do is... Look, give examples. Now, if you were a Christian, I would have been happy to deal with you as a Christian. Because if you said I made mockery, I said this is what the Bible says. This is how the Bible put it. He said, oh generation of wipers, you whited sepulchers, you wicked and adulterous generation. Now if that is offensive to anybody, I said these are not my words. I never spoke like that. I never uttered words to that effect. You see, that you fools, you hypocrites, you brood of snakes. You know who's talking like that? Jesus in the Bible. He says, you brood of snakes, you wicked and adulterous generation. Do you know all that? Do you know that Jesus speaks like that? The Christians say, this is how Jesus spoke. You know, he insulted his mother. He says, woman, what have I to do with you? Do you know that? So, Am I making a mockery or is the Bible making a mockery of the man? I want to know. If you were a Christian, I could have asked you. I said, look, man, you don't know your own book. I'm only quoting you what he's supposed to have said. He said, do not throw the bread of the children to the dogs. Now you must come forward, the Christian must come forward and say, look, Jesus never said any such thing. I am making a mockery of his religion. I said, look, this is what Jesus said. He said, do not throw that which is holy into dogs. Do not throw pearls before swine. Am I making a mockery of you making a mockery? If you are a Christian, I say, you are making a mockery of Jesus. This mighty messenger of God, whom we believe that he was born miraculously, am I right? He was born miraculously as a Muslim, we believe, without any male intervention. This book gives us two genealogies of Jesus, Matthew and Luke. They give you 66 fathers and grandfathers to a man who had no father. Now, I want to know who's making a mockery, the Quran or the Bible? 66 fathers and grandfathers to a man who had no father. And out of the two lists given by Matthew and Luke, there's only one name common to the both lists, Joseph the carpenter. And he's not supposed to be there because he's not the actual father of Jesus. Am I right? He was a Muslim. But he is supposed to be the father of Jesus Christ. And Luke says so. Luke says, and Jesus happened to be about 30 years of age when he began to preach, who being the son of Joseph. Who being the son of Joseph. That's what Luke says. In the words are there, after that, in brackets, as was supposed. And if you ask any Christian scholar, any Christian scholar, what are these words doing in brackets? They will tell you that Luke in his manuscripts, in the Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Alexandrianus, these words are not there. These are the words of the editors. So Luke said that Jesus is the son of Joseph. As was supposed are your words, man's words. Who is making a mockery of Jesus, the Muslim or the Christian? So you see, you as a Muslim, it was very, very unfair. The unkindliest cut was from you. I would have preferred a Christian to say that, then I could have presented all these things to him. Coming back to the comparative study and comparison between the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Jesus, last Islam, one aspect of comparison you didn't give is I'd like to ask your opinion on that comparison. And that is when we, as a general or majority of Muslims, believe that Jesus Christ did not die on the cross. And he is with God, God raised him, and he is sitting on the right hand side of the God, and he will come back to lead the Muslims to a total victory. My question is that if you're comparing the two prophets and you compare their status according to their responsibility, and you give Muhammad, peace be upon him, a higher responsibility and a higher status, then why is it that he died just like you and I and is buried under the ground while Jesus lives and is raised, and he comes back, and he's a responsibility to lead the Muslims who had gone astray, who are 
the followers of the Prophet Muhammad and lead them to a total victory which Muhammad could not achieve in his time. Our brother, before you go, are you asking as a Muslim or as a Christian? Muslim, but it doesn't matter really. It does matter because then I can give you proofs according to your background, your experience and mentality. You see, you are confusing the Muslim idea with the Christian idea where you said and sitting on the right hand of God. I want to know where you got that from. From the house of Islam or from Christianity? From elders of Islam. From? From elders of I haven't read, but I, from the elders of Islam. No elder of the Muslim tell you that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God. Unfortunately, there are some who do though. Well, that means, look. <laughs> okay. All right. You have, you have All made right. your point that that is incorrect. Can you correct Right. Number one, we do not believe that Christ died. We believe that he was not crucified. Videotapes and books are available on the subject, crucifixion or crucifixion. Whether it was a fiction, F-I-C-T-I-U-N, fiction, F-I-C-F-I-X-I-U-N, fiction, means to fix up a person on the cross and kill him, or was it F-I-C-T-I-U-N, fiction, means a fairy tale. And according to the Quranic teaching, when Allah says, illa tiba zan, they only follow conjecture, guesswork, fiction. We prove in this book from the Christian Bible, the whole story is a fiction. And if you can get any bishop, if you can organize an Anglican bishop or an archbishop to have this thing debated with me, we are prepared to hire the NEC at our expense. And we will give you 10,000 pounds in the bargain. If you can get any Anglican or Roman Catholic bishop or archbishop to debate this subject with us in NEC Birmingham, which is the largest covered hall in Europe, we are prepared to organize that meeting at our expense and give you 10,000 pounds in the bargain. With regards to... <laughs> with regards to people waiting for Jesus and make, come and make the masters of the world, you see, the Bible tells us that Jesus is coming for a special purpose. And that purpose is found in the Gospel of St. Matthew. He says that on that day, on that day, his second coming, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty works? Then Jesus says, then will I profess unto them, I will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Get away from me, I don't even know you. Now, that is his purpose. People who have misunderstood him, they started worshipping him as Lord, as God, instead of the Father in heaven. So he is coming to rectify them. I'm not waiting for Jesus. I don't need anything at all. Whatever Allah wanted to give, he's given it to me, here, in the Quran. The He can't come and teach the Muslims that, you know, Maghrib, you make three rakats, make it four. He can't come to teach us, you fasting for 30 days, you fast for 40. There's nothing he can teach us. The Muslim has, as Allah tells in the Quran, a deen which is absolutely complete. As Allah says, Al yawma akmaltu lakum deenukum. This day I have perfected for your religion. Wa atmamtu alaykum na'mati. And have completed my favors unto you. Wa raditu lakum al islam And I will that Islam should be your religion. Everything that Allah wanted to give has given it to us and we have it and I'm not waiting for Jesus Nor do I expect any Muslim to wait for Jesus or for anybody else to help him out in guiding himself to the way of Allah A little extension of the last question which is a long while ago, but I won't repeat it I want you to just give me your response to this. You say that there's nobody who can say that the Holy Spirit has given an answer to the problems in the world like the problems in Britain, uh, where's the answer that the Holy Spirit has given? And I'd just like to say, and that should be a response to this, that, um, okay, you can say that I found my answer in the Bible because it just suited me at the time. It, it was something that I've grasped at the time. Um, but I've found something in the Bible. I've, I've got the Quran as well, and I've read about a quarter of it. I'm reading the Quran in English. Um, but I've found something, I've been to Pakistan as well, I've travelled around a bit and, and talked to a lot of people. Um, but I've not found anything in the Quran or in Islam that could replace what I've found in the Bible, which I believe can only be found if you ask God. Can, I just you. can you please come to the question please? Yeah. I'd like to know your response to, 
um, as, as a Christian, I believe that in the Bible, there's a deeper answer than saying to a society like Britain, if you all become Muslims and all obey... I'm sorry, sir, I have to stop you there. Can you please ask a question? Well, my, my question is... We don't need our time, actually. Surely there's, the there's got to be more than something which is imposed on a society from the outside. Something that's got to reach into the heart to change us from the inside. And I don't find that in Islam. I find that you can have some good um, moral guidelines in Islam, like in other religions. But I don't find in Islam... I just want you to tell me where it is. Um, where I can... Have what I've got with Christ, what Christ has come in and he's changed my nature. You know, what I was before and what I am now. How could I have my sir, nature changed through Islam? Can I please have the, yes. another, can I please have somebody else asking a question? Well, I'm I'm sorry, sorry, just... I cannot answer this question, it's just so vague. Okay. Can you come back to the question? And the question is, how could, um, through um, Muhammad and through the Quran, that you've been talking about the difference between Christ and Muhammad, that's the subject. Um, how could Muhammad give me a change in my heart, in my nature, so that I could love people? How could he give me that? Christ has given me it, this is what I claim. How could Muhammad give me that, what Christ has given me? You see the Muslims here? What Islam has done. This community that you see here, they have the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. This community here. We have our drunkards. And we have our cutthroats and our gamblers and all, like any other community. But on a percentage basis, there's not another nation on earth that can show a candle to us in brotherhood, in piety, in charity, in sobriety. The biggest society of teetotalers in the world are the Muslims. You say you went to Pakistan. I'm sure you must have come across some drunkards. But as a people as a whole, the nation as a whole, Muslims wherever you go, the biggest society of teetotalers in the world are Muslims. The least racist of people are the Muslims. The most racist of people are the Christian whites. I said the Christian whites, I didn't say you. As a people, as a whole. Look, here, Jesus Christ said, by the fruits you shall know them. Do men gather figs from the thistle or grapes from the thorn? He said, every good tree will be good fruit, and every evil tree will be evil fruit. He said, by the fruits ye shall know them. Judge them by the fruits. Judge them. We are not angels, but judge them, and you will have the answer. Um, basically, you posed me, by your debate, you've actually posed a certain problem to me in the sense that um, I understood that the Bible is in, cell, in itself um, a revelation. And yet it's been revealed through this debate that a lot of it is actually uh, based on massive contradiction and, and factual error. Do I then have to read the Quran thoroughly and then filter through? I, w I basically want you to advise me, do I have to read the Quran and filter through that, which I believe is to be the, the tenets of the Christian faith as well, in other words, do I only believe that which is referred to as Hazrat Isa in the Quran um, as to be the, the, the teachings of, his, of, of, of Christian Christianity? See, everything that the Quran tells us, we believe, is Allah's kalam. So whatever he tells you that, look, Jesus didn't preach these things, that Jesus Christ didn't die. He was not killed, nor was he crucified. That's what Allah says. But now we can prove it from the Christian's own book. You see, what the Quran says, the Quran says, there is no trinity. So the Christian says here, my King James Version, open. First epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. So you open. It's a read. So you read. It says, for there are three, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So here's my trinity. Is there in his book. Now what are you going to say? So he says, wait a minute, who produced this book? Christian scholars. Fifth major revision, Christian scholars. But you have here another Bible called the Revised Standard Version. Who produced this? 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations of Christendom, they produced this. What does this book do? He said, this one here goes to the most ancient manuscripts. 
This Roman Catholic version goes to the ancient manuscripts. The King James version goes to the ancient manuscripts. Ancient means four to six hundred years after Jesus. Most ancient means 300 years after Jesus. So the most ancient will be most authentic. If we had something 100 years after Jesus, it's still more authentic. If in the time of Jesus something was written, still more authentic. If Christ wrote it himself, shh, no doubt whatsoever. Right? This goes to closest to the period, third century of the Christian era. In this now you open, is thrown out as a fabrication. Who threw it out? Muslims? Muslims were telling them, we're supposed to have told them, Wala taqulu salasa. Don't say Trinity. Stop it. It'll be better for you. That is what we're supposed to do. We didn't, but they took it out of the RSV as a fabrication. Right? Look, they're coming closer to us. They say that Jesus, remember that somebody came along, John 3, 16, he quoted in different words. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that he should die to save you. This word begotten, Allah tells us to tell them, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not beget and is not begotten. But he said, look, he's in my book. Where? He brings it here, John 3.16. Open this, going back to the most ancient manuscript, the word begotten is thrown out. It's no more there. He says, congratulations, man. Look, you're coming to, but you're dragging your feet. The Anglican church, more than 50% of the bishops, they say to the church, Members, that you do not have to believe that Jesus is God anymore. You don't have to believe. That is what we are trying to tell them. That is what we have been trying to tell them all along, that Jesus is not God. More than 50% of the bishops, they are telling the flock now, that look, you don't have to believe that Jesus is God. That means they're coming closer to us. The trouble with us is that we are not taking advantage of this opening that they're giving to us. They are dragging the feet. You encourage them to come quicker into the house of Islam to save themselves. This is what we are supposed to do now. Look, the thing is there, the, the Bible, they are changing, changing, but they're coming closer to us. They're taking out the fabrications, the adulterations, the interpolation. They're taking it out, and as such, they're coming closer, but they're dragging their feet. We have to encourage them to walk a little faster because time is running out too fast. Good evening. I'm a born-again Christian, believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, who was crucified, dead and buried, arose, and as someone says, at this moment, at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for one and for all. I do appreciate your um, teachings or whatever it may be, about the Muslim faith, which I listen and according to what you have said, that those who believe in the Muslim faith should go and win those who believe in Christianity. I would like to know the reason why you want the Muslim to change the Christians and not the Christians to change the Muslim. You see, the Christians at the present moment, they are busy throughout the world. There are 70,000 crusaders, Christian crusaders, are raising the dust in the world. The Christian world has produced more than 60,000 books against Islam from 1800 to 1950. More than 60,000. I was giving all these facts and figures at the previous meeting. There are some, out of the 70,000 missionaries that the Christian world Crusaders that I've sent out, 60% are Americans. 42,000 Americans are raising the dust in the world today. Your churches are busy here in Birmingham. You know, I don't know whether you know international crusades from Canada. They have now moved to Birmingham. And they changed the name from international crusades to international teams. You know that? And they are now organizing teams of Christian missionaries to work among the Muslims of Birmingham. And I'm sure they're doing it here in Bradford. Christians of every denomination. Look, this young man gave his card. You know what does it say? Youth for Christ. He has invited people to his home. He didn't have the guts or the temerity to ask a question. He wants this innocent people to come along for a cup of tea and biscuits so he can brainwash him. I want to know what he wants them, them to do at, at his house. When he didn't have the the guts to come and ask a single question.
So you say you are born again. And I take it that your profession is preaching. Your profession is preaching. Your occupation is preaching. Yes, yes, you are a preacher. Are you preaching only to Christians? Are you preaching only to Christians? No, I try, for as Christ said, go ye into all the world. You may ask, where about do I go away from England? I will say, I haven't been to nowhere else since I've been a uh, born again Christian, for it's just in England here that I became a Christian. But as I go on, on the street, there are many who sat in this congregation who knew me very much, for at times I associate with plenty of uh, people's home that I go and visit them. But my old aim and desire is, as Christ says, tell it to the world, tell it to the nation. Christ, in his uh, loss, going away from the earth, according to St. John chapter 17, he prayed that his Father should glorify him. He said, now the time has come when I will be leaving these here, and I pray for them that you may keep them. They are in the world, but not of the world. And he goes on and he says, not only these alone, but... Is that your question, sir? Excuse me. Is that your question? Sir, that's no. preaching. Let him preach. <laughs> this is an, an opportunity like this he'll never get again in his lifetime. So many Muslims that they can hear him. Now, you see, this is what I say, this born-again sickness. You don't know the rights of others. People, they're born again, they, have, they don't know about the rights. There's an Englishman comes along and he's going round and round in circle. He's not a speaker, he says. And he wastes everybody's 10 minutes. You see, he's born again. Everyone that is born again, he comes along to preach and he goes. Your question. Now, yes. your, as much as you, sh 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 sh, as much as you feel that you should share your faith with others, we are commanded more directly to address you. You remember in the verses that I read, I said, Qul, telling them, Allah says, Qul, tell them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O Jews and Christians, Ta'ala, ila. See, we are told to call the Jews and you more directly by name, Ta'ala, ila kalimatin sawa'in bainana wa bainakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. And that common platform, the terms and conditions of getting together are number one, Allah na Buddha illallah, that we worship none but Allah, God Almighty. The only God we shall worship is the God, the Father in heaven. Not Moses, not David, Solomon, Jesus or Muhammad, but the Father in heaven. Let's worship him. We said, yes, but he's a triune God. He's three in one. So we are told to tell you, wala taqulu thalasa. Don't say Trinity. Intahu khair lakum. This is stop it. It'll be better for you. Inna mallahu ilahu wahid. For your God is one God. He's not three in one. So all these instructions are given to us to bring you back to the path because you have drifted away. Instead of worshiping the Father in heaven, you are worshiping Jesus. Am I right? You are worshiping Jesus. Yes. Jesus is your Lord. Yes, but the Bible says no one goes to God except to Jesus Christ. Thank you. You see, this is this is very. very this is a sickness. What Jesus said was, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's right. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yes. Now, of course, you know that. But if I ask you what is the context, you don't know the context. You don't know. You just quote the thing out of text. You see, if you quote anything out of context, it's a pretext for preaching what you want to preach. That's what you have been doing. I am asking you or any other Christian that is there, what is the context of that verse? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In what sense, in what, with what background did he utter those words? That if their soul should be saved, unless they Not the purpose, the context. You know, look, man, you are an English-speaking person, maybe from Jamaica, you know English. You know what is text? You quote the text. I want the context, the text that goes with it before or after. You understand English? Otherwise, leave it to somebody who does. Good evening, sir. I assume that you believe in prophets. Prophets of God. I do as well. Uh, you believe especially in your prophet Muhammad, is that correct name, Muhammad? Yes. 
Right. You were supposed to be asking questions. Yes. You know, not acting as a public prosecutor, you know, oh, what about... No, you? no I beg your pardon, the two fields are playing. You ask your question, sir, I will answer. And ask your question and finish right. it, and I will answer. Do you believe that we are the prophets in these latter days living on earth, living prophets? That's your question? Yes. Right. Thank you. Go to the back if you have another question. I will answer that. I will answer that. We believe... I don't know in the declaration that I made, there is no prophet after Muhammad. The last and final messenger of God is Muhammad. There shall be no prophet after him. He says, La Nabi Ba'di, there shall be no prophet after me. See, if a thing is complete, which we believe that the Quran is a complete guidance of God given to mankind. Once a thing is complete, anything you add to it is a monstrosity. This hand, yours and mine, perfect. God made it. Perfect. You can't add another finger, you can't add another thumb. You can't have ten more fingers to improve your hand. Anything you add to this perfect hand is a monstrosity. Similarly, in the guidance of God as given to us in the Quran, perfect teaching for all times, for all people. You can't add, a prophet means a person comes along now and he can change the law. If he's God's mouthpiece, now he has a right to tell you that now you can marry your own mother. He can tell you that. If he's a prophet, he can tell you, sir, God tells me you can marry your mother, you can marry your daughter, you can marry your sister. Shh, he says, no, there shall be no prophet after Muhammad. That is what we believe. No prophet after him. Small or big, no prophet whatsoever. Yes, brother, next one. Assalamu alaikum, sir. I, I'm a Muslim. Uh, we Muslim call Hazrat Isa al-Islam, and here's a lot of Christian, they call Jesus Christ. I think it's important for me to request you that could you let the audience know here, including Christian and Muslim, what was the religion of Jesus Christ and what did he taught? Did he taught Islam or was he Muslim or non-Muslim? Thank you. Thank you. The question was, of course, you heard, what was the religion of Jesus? The religion of Jesus was Islam. The religion of Moses was Islam. The religion of all true prophets of God is Islam. Because with Allah, there is only one religion. He says, Inna dina in the Allah al-Islam. Most certainly the religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. If you want a religion other than Islam, so Allah will not accept it from you. From you. And you will be of the losers. Anything else other than Islam? So I said, now the religion of Moses was Islam, the religion of Jesus was Islam, the religion of speech by Muhammad was Islam, it was nothing but Islam. And the proof of that is, you ask the Jew. Start with, ask the Jew. In our line relationship, we are very closely related to the religion of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. Three are related, very close. If Moses was alive with us, and if you asked him, oh Moses, what is your religion? I do not expect him to say Judaism. Because this word Judaism is not in his Torah, is not in his Talmud, is not in his Mithna, is, is nowhere to be found in Jewish literature. The word Judaism is not to be found. You see, it's a concocted word, concocted word. But if Moses was alive and if you asked him, what is your religion, he would say that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. A lengthy definition. But one word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. Islam means a religion of total submission to God's will. If Jesus was alive with us today, or in his second coming, if we have a chance to meet him, and if we ask him, so, oh Jesus, what is your religion? We do not expect him to say Christianity. Because if he says Christianity, we can ask him, what church you belong to, sir? Are you a Roman Catholic or an Anglican or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a Jehovah's Witness? Silly, silly, you would say. It's a silly thing to ask Jesus. I expect him to say that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. Lengthy definition. One word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. This is what he came to teach. But if the people, his followers, they took his religion off the rails, actually Paul, they are all following Paul. They are not following Jesus. If they follow Jesus, they will be Muslims. See, because Jesus was teaching them nothing but Islam. The Father in heaven, worship him. 
they start worshipping Jesus. See, this is not his teaching. As the Quran tells us, testifies on the day of judgment, Allah will ask him, Oh Jesus, did you tell your people to worship you and your mother besides Allah? They said, Oh my, Tala, oh my Lord, you know I never did any such thing. As long as I was with them, I was a watcher over them to see that they never did any such blasphemies. But after you took me up, you know what they did. So, in tu'azzibhum fa'innahum ibaduka. So if you punish them, they are your servants. Wa in ta'fir lahum fa'innaka antal azizul hakim. But if you forgive them, you are exalted in might, you are wise in your wisdom, you can do what you please. But the religion of Jesus was Islam and he was a Muslim. In the garden of Gethsemane, you read in the Bible, that he went there and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. He made the sujood and prayed to God, said, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. But not as I will, but as thou wilt. One word for that, not as I will, but as thou wilt, is a Muslim. I have submitted my will to the will of Allah. Jesus was a Muslim and his religion was Islam. A few minutes ago, somebody stood up and said that he thought I had got the impression that you had been marking the Bible. I must say that, I'm sorry to say this, I also got the same impression. Uh, I will give you an example though. You point to the red letter Bible and show what small quantity of it is highlighted in red. However, there's a large quantity also which is not highlighted in red which describes the actions of Jesus Christ and not his words, are these not equally important? You see, he says, I made a mockery of it because I say the red letter Bible. In the red letter Bible, everything that Jesus said is in red and is only 10% of the whole of the New Testament, only 10%. So what is the mockery? I'm telling you that, look, this is not the book of Jesus. We Muslims are made to believe that Jesus Christ was given a revelation. A wahi. God Almighty inspired him. And that inspiration we call the Injil. That inspiration which God gave him. And he preached this Injil. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They all tell us that Jesus went to Bradford and he preached the gospel. He went to Blackburn and he preached the, for example. Blackburn, he went to Birmingham and he preached the gospel, 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 gospel. Again and again. Gospel. What was he preaching? Did he have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John under his arm? Did he have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Peter, Paul, James, Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians, carrying him under his arm? Is that what he was doing? No. Whatever he was preaching was from God. And that message which he preached, we say the Injil. And that even if we accept every word in red, every word of yours in red, your scholars, they have brought this about. Every word in red, we find is only one-tenth of this New Testament. One-tenth. Ninety percent is words of other people. They're talking about him. Not quoting even a single verse. Twenty-one out of twenty-seven books, not one word is even quoted of Jesus. Um, basically, you've posed to me, by your debate, you've actually posed a certain problem to me in the sense that um, I understood that the Bible is in, cel in itself um, a revelation. And yet, and yet it's been revealed through this debate that a lot of it is actually uh, based on massive contradiction and, and factual error. Do I then have to read the Quran thoroughly and then filter through? I, w I basically want you to advise me, do I have to read the Quran and filter through that, which I believe is to be the, the tenets of the Christian faith as well, in other words, do I only believe that which is referred to as Hazrat Isa in the Quran um, as to be the, the, the teachings of, his, of, of, of Christian Christianity? You see, everything that the Quran tells us, we believe is Allah's kalam. So whatever he tells you that, look, Jesus didn't preach these things, that Jesus Christ didn't die. He was not killed, nor was he crucified. That's what Allah says. But now we can prove it from the Christian's own book. You see, what the Quran says, the Quran says there is no trinity. So the Christian says here, my King James Version, open. First epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. So you open. It's a read. So you read. It says, for there are three, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So here's my trinity. Is there in his book? 
Now what are you going to say? So he says, wait a minute, who produced this book? Christian scholars. Fifth major revision, Christian scholars. But you have here another Bible called the Revised Standard Version. Who produced this? 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations of Christendom, they produced this. What does this book do? It says this one here goes to the most ancient manuscripts. This Roman Catholic version goes to the ancient manuscripts. The King James version goes to the ancient manuscripts. Ancient means four to six hundred years after Jesus. Most ancient means 300 years after Jesus. So the most ancient will be most authentic. If we had something 100 years after Jesus, it's still more authentic. If in the time of Jesus something was written, still more authentic. If Christ wrote it himself, shh, no doubt whatsoever. Right? This goes to closest to the period, third century, third century of the Christian era. In this now you open, is thrown out as a fabrication. Who threw it out? Muslims? Muslims were telling them, we're supposed to have told them, Wala taqulu salasa. Don't say Trinity. Stop it. It'll be better for you. That is what we're supposed to do. We didn't, but they took it out of the RSV as a fabrication. Right? Look, they're coming closer to us. They said that Jesus, remember that somebody came along, John 3.16 he quoted in different words. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that he should die for the to save you. This word begotten, Allah tells us to tell them, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not beget and is not begotten. But he said, look, he's in my book. Where? He brings it here, John 3.16. Open this, going back to the most ancient manuscript, the word begotten is thrown out. It's no more there. He says, congratulations, man. Look, you're coming to, but you're dragging your feet. The Anglican church, more than 50% of the bishops, they say to the church, Members, that you do not have to believe that Jesus is God anymore. You don't have to believe. That is what we are trying to tell them. That is what we have been trying to tell them all along, that Jesus is not God. More than 50% of the bishops, they are telling their flock now, that look, you don't have to believe that Jesus is God. That means they're coming closer to us. The trouble with us is that we are not taking advantage of this opening that they're giving to us. They are dragging the feet. You encourage them to come quicker into the house of Islam to save themselves. This is what we are supposed to do now. Look, the thing is there, the, the, the Bible, they are changing, changing, but they're coming closer to us. They're taking out the fabrications, the adulterations, the interpolation, they're taking it out, and as such, they're coming closer, but they're dragging their feet. We have to encourage them to walk a little fast because time is running out too fast. Earlier on, he used the word out of holy Quran, which was like Rafidi. Does that mean thou shalt not force? Uh, I think you're referring to the Quranic verse I quoted, La ikraha fi which means there is no compulsion in religion. In matters of religion, you can't force anybody to accept your deen. Whether he's a Hindu, whether he's an atheist, he's a Christian, Jew, whoever it is, we have no right. Suppose we are in a position to force people, we are not to force anybody. That is what the message of the Quran is. Yeah, that means thou shalt not force. Thou shalt not force. Yes, right. yes sir. My second one is Islam means peace and submission. You live in peace and you submit to one God. Yes. Right? Now, there's a sect in Pakistan called the Andi Muslims. They are persecuted and prosecuted by the mullahs. Why? You see, there is no compulsion in religion. But if you have a nation or community, and one of you is a traitor, you see, if you believe in any state, any state, you do, do certain things wrong. You get caught for speeding, you get caught, you run over somebody, culpable homicide, that's not considered as murder. But if you have treason against the state, which is something unforgivable, treason. You know, suppose Hitler wanted to invade Britain, and one of you Britisher was in league with the, with the German intelligence, and passing over information, if they caught you, firing spot. No forgiveness. 
Oh, they're very compassionate people, the British. Very loving people, the when British. When you use the word Hitler, that means the dictatorship. Whatever. The fact is that any time you collude with the enemy, the outsider, if you're going to undermine your own community, that crime is a crime of treason against the community, and the community can't forgive. That is... Cannot judge other people, but God Brother, you can right be right judging right. yourself. Look, I have no right to judge. But when you come to me and tell me, says, look, there is another prophet has come after Muhammad, you are breaking the, the, the unity of the Muslim Ummah. That means now you are a traitor to my brotherhood. No. <laughs>